Listen, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. Good morning. How many of you here were, were here Friday night? Friday night, we had this epic worship night. But I'm realizing that, that was more than just a fun event. It was more than just a wild night of worship. We have, we've broken into something new as a church. Something is happening. And I don't really know exactly what it is. And I don't really, really care because I know it's good. I know it's, I've, I'm, I've walked with God long enough to know when God is doing something and when I'm trying to make something happen. There's a big difference. And I think there was this unity there Friday night that I experienced this sense of like, we were, it wasn't like a couple people were being rowdy and the rest of us were like, what are y'all doing over there? It was like this sense that God was doing something, taking us on a little bit of a journey through something rowdy, and then we would come down into something peaceful. And I think that's something of what he's doing in us as a church. And I am increasingly confident that the breakthrough we're experiencing as a church is at least in part, if not mostly due to Merle and Sue's faithfulness to step out into the unknown, to obey God, do what God has asked them to do with this. It's a massive act of faith and generosity. If you didn't know, Merle, and Merle is our lead pastor. We've had a succession. I'm the new lead pastor. This happened a month ago. And there's something that God is doing, I believe, as a response to their act of faithfulness and generosity and boldness. And we get to benefit from it. It's awesome. So thank you, Merle and Sue. We love you. Maybe you're watching online. And thank you to the rest of you for your part in this. Sometimes we go through years of doing what we feel like God is calling us to do without seeing any visible fruit or any visible breakthrough. Anyone ever been there? And then one, God's like, one day God's like, okay, now's the time for it. And it comes. And it's up to him. That's what makes him God and not us. He decides the timing. He decides the way. And um, anyway, that's, that's part of what we're beginning to see. Let's pray. with God, we thank you for what you're doing here at Grace Covenant as a church. I thank you for what you're doing in so many individual people here. God, would you help us to steward what you're doing in a way that honors you and it makes room for you? God, we want to be faithful to you. We want to be devoted to you. I pray that you would help us this morning to hear clearly from you. And God, would you give us the courage to obey you, whatever you ask, in Jesus' name, amen. Well, it's fascinating to me how different kids can be growing up in the same family. Any of you any different than your siblings? I mean, any twins in here? Yeah. Are you different from your sister or brother? Probably, yeah. yeah, probably. Even twins. Even if you're like genetically the same, whatever, you're not. Even in the same family. Take my kids, for example. Take my kids with money. Okay, I'm not going to use any names. <laughs> but my kids couldn't be any different in how they spend money. One of them is an absolute minimalist. I mean, you cannot get this kid to spend money on anyone, especially themselves, barely. The other burns cash so fast, they're chronically in debt to me. It's like asking me for advances on their allowance coming up, right? And it helps me to remember I was just like that second one when I was a kid. And I remember being at the beach, Sea Isle City, New Jersey, where we'd go every summer and camp. And I remember, I remember arguing with my dad how it made so much sense that I would spend my summer savings at the arcade. Well, <laughs> he didn't think that was a great idea, but I did. I mean, this is almost 40 years ago. I did get this fine shark. This is a real shark. I won this at the arcade. 
in New Jersey, lo these many almost 40 years ago. I, I mean, I would consider this a good investment. Can you even buy such a thing anymore? It freaks my whole family out, but it's real. I just find it fascinating how, how differently all of us spend whatever we have. We all have limited money, time, energy. But according to the passage we just heard, we're supposed to spend it all on God. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all, which, and I looked it up, and the word all in the original Greek, Hebrew, and Aramaic, it means all, with all your strength. Does this word all concern anyone else here, or is it just me? I must not be a person of great faith, because, like, if this is a real command, which it is, by the way, I believe that, if we spend all we have on God, what's left for us or anyone else? Fortunately for us, God can command unlimited impossible things like this because his resources are unlimited. We were looking at the stars the other night in our backyard, and my son Emmett's like, look at, look at it with the binoculars. And we look at it with the binoculars, and there's like infinitely more than you could see with the natural eye with the binoculars. His resources are unlimited. And he's promised to share those unlimited resources with us if, and it is an if, if we share them with others. He's designed us to receive extravagantly that we might spend ourselves extravagantly. And when we spend what we have his way, we can be confident we'll always have what we need. All throughout the scriptures, we see strength as a gift God wants to give his people. Moses and his sister Miriam, that would be a good, good name for a band, by the way, Moses and his sister Miriam. <laughs> when they got out of Egypt, they sang this song, the Lord is my strength and my defense. The prophet Isaiah famously said, he gives strength to the weary, and to him who lacks might, he increases power. Even youth grow weary and tired, and vigorous young men with their perfect knees stumble badly. Yet, those who wait for the Lord will gain new strength. They will mount up with wings like eagles. They'll run and they won't get tired. They'll walk and they won't become weary. The promise of strength is included 70 unique times in the book of Psalms, more than twice that of any other scripture. The Lord gives strength to his people. The Lord is my strength and my shield, King David wrote. And the apostle Paul famously wrote, I can do all things, anything, everything through him who gives me strength. Jesus told Paul, my power is made perfect in your weakness. We, like, we so badly wish there was another way, but that is how it works. <laughs> when you're weak, then there's room for God to come in and do something. Otherwise, you're like, I don't need him. Things are pretty good. Why is it that, why is it that the poor throughout the world seem more interested in the things of God a lot of times? There's this awareness of need. God gave each of us a unique type and amount of strength. You can do things I can't, no matter how hard I try. I remember about 20 years ago, I was bored in construction, and my wife was in school to be a counselor. And one evening, we had to show up at Merle and Sue's house at like 9 o'clock to settle a little argument between my wife and I, because I was convinced I should, be, I should become a counselor. She wasn't so sure of that because she knows I like to talk more than I like to listen. So we ended up at Merle and Sue's house. And at Merle and Sue's, we kind of tell them this whole thing, and I'm like, yeah, I think I should become a counselor, because, I don't know, for whatever reason I said that. And they were like, uh-huh, uh-huh. What does Mercy think? And she's like, oh, I, don't, I don't think that's right for you. You would get bored sitting, listening for eight hours a day to people. 
I was like, you just don't want me to do what you're doing. Take, move in on your territory, your career territory. And I was like, so Merle and Sue, what do you think I should do this, right? And they're like, no, no, we don't think that's the right fit for you, you know? <laughs> we don't all have the same gifting. We don't all have the same capacity, and God knows specifically what your strengths are, and that's what he wants to give you because I don't have them. We don't all have the same thing. So you not only have a unique strength set, God gives each of us a unique amount of strength based on his perfect design plan of what's best for you. We don't all start with the same set of strengths or the amount of strengths, but we can all grow into it. This is true for families and for churches who we don't have to be Crosslink or Duck or anyone else because God's called us to be us. He's called Grace Covenant to be Grace Covenant. Isn't that freeing in a way? And that's why he's made the body of Christ so diverse. Let the Mennonites do their thing. Let the Catholics do their thing. And the Lutherans and the Episcopals and the Methodists and the Brethren and let them do their thing. Collectively, we represent something of the strength and goodness of God. God has intentionally and pers purposefully distributed strength differently, I would even say unevenly, so that we will all need one another, so that we would lean on one another's strengths, so that we would, be, we would become interdependent and we would be saved from the lonely world that we're invited into every day of individualism and self-sufficiency. Every day you're invited into that. You can do that. You don't need them. Don't tell them that. You'll look weak. Tell them that. So here's my big question for you. If strength or power is a resource like time or money, what will you spend it on? If strength or power is a resource like time or money, what will you spend it on? How you spend the strength that God has given you determines both the quality and the quantity of strength God can trust you with going forward. How you spend what you have determines how much more he's going to give you. To love God with our strength means to apply yourself. It means to use whatever you have. It means to exercise effort, to use the strength God has given you in a specific direction for a specific purpose. Here's a few areas we could all spend our strength on in a way that would honor God. Unity, purity, and eternity. And I love that they all end with in the same. That doesn't often work that way. It takes work. It takes work to foster an environment of unity, to live a life of purity, to live for eternity. It takes work because it takes energy and time and strength. First of all, unity. Spend your strength on building and keeping unity in the church. Where there is unity, God brings some added blessing. That's Psalm 133. Jesus said our love for one another would be our testimony to the world. He said our unity would be our greatest witness to the planet. So it's, it's something we benefit from. Unity is something we benefit from. We receive God's blessing. But it's also something that is this loud voice to the rest of the world. There is a God, and he's a God of love. Unity within the church, unity between us, benefits the world outside the church. In the same way, unity between a married man and woman benefits their children. Don't we know that's true? When mom and dad are fighting and after each other, even if it's that wicked, cold silence, the kids pick up on it and they suffer from it. The phrase, make every effort, is all over Paul's letters to the first century churches, and it comes from Jesus as well. The phrase is often used in reference to unity within the church. Unity does not come naturally, though. Self-preservation Self-fulfillment comes naturally. Criticism, offense comes naturally. It takes work, effort, strength to push through that 
to create an environment of unity, valuing the community above ourselves. Jesus gave his life up for this. And so we honor the death and the resurrection of Christ when we live with unity. A few verses related to that. Romans 14, 19 says, let us therefore make every effort to do what leads to peace and mutual edification. Ephesians 4, 3 says, make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit. Jesus died for unity. It's our work to maintain it, keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. You know, iron sharp, have you ever heard iron sharpens iron? It's Proverbs 17, 17, I think. Iron sharpens iron. Well, how does it sharpen itself? It has to be close, it has to be united. If you're not growing, it's possible you're not close enough to enough other people. Or maybe you've isolated yourself into some group where you all think exactly alike, and you're not going to grow there. The friction we experience in relationship is what makes us grow, but we have to make every effort to stay in that place of unity. Hebrews 12, 14, make every effort to live in peace. Why does it have to be so hard? Make every effort to live in peace with everyone and to be holy. Wait, wait, wait. Make every effort to live in peace with everyone and to be holy? Because without holiness, no one will see the Lord. This last one combines two primary works that God has called us to. The one is working for the peace of unity that's like on this horizontal level. And the other is peace with God. So this leads to the second one, work for purity. Spend your strength on growing in holiness. Spend your strength on growing in Christ's likeness, in this deep, beautiful, strong character. This is something we partner with God in. Now, most heresies in the Christian faith fall off of a narrow path into one of two gutters. The one gutter is, it's all up to God, so I'll just kind of do whatever I want. The other path is, it's all up to me, which is ridiculously stressful and makes God redundant or unnecessary because it's all up to me, so who really needs God? Those are the two common gutters we fall into. But Paul told the people of Rome, offer your body, offer yourself as a sacrifice, a living sacrifice to God. Well, to offer a sacrifice is costly. You know, they used to offer lambs. We'd be bringing like our cars to the temple or something every week. It takes effort. It takes strength, it takes sacrifice, it takes self-discipline to offer yourself, not just one time, but to every day, put yourself back, put yourself back out there for the Lord, to offer yourself as something pure and beautiful to God. This is our act of worship. We work on ourselves, we work on building character, not to earn our salvation, but as a response to our salvation. There's a big difference, huge difference. God alone can save you. God alone can clean you up enough to have you in heaven. God alone can make you right with God. But we have a role here too. The fancy word of sanctification is this act of setting yourself apart for God, choosing to set yourself apart for God. It takes effort to apply yourself to the process of sanctification. It's this progressive daily work of God and humans together, working together, that makes us ever more free, younger. This is what I love about being a Christian. I get younger every day. Not physically. My hair's falling out. My knee's all jacked up. But inside, I'm a little more free 
all the time. I care a little bit less what anybody thinks of me. I'm a little more obsessed with God and what God thinks of me. I'm like, I don't have as much fear. I can become like a little kid who knows God's going to work that thing out. That is a beautiful thing that we are invited into. And that's a process. Most people don't become a Christian in the immediate day. They're filled with like radical courage and peace. And no, you grow into it. Jesus said, it takes work though. Jesus said, make every effort to enter through the narrow door. Jesus, why do you have to make it so hard? Because many, I tell you, will try to enter and they won't get in. Peter said, so, dear friends, make every effort to be found spotless, blameless, at peace with him. Well, if Jesus made us spotless and blameless, why would we have to make any effort? We're in part trying to, re we're partly trying to walk out what he has already done for us. Paul told Timothy, make every effort to present yourself approved to God, an unashamed workman who accurately handles the truth. Peter said, make every effort to add to your faith goodness and to goodness knowledge and to knowledge self-control and to self-control perseverance, godliness and to godliness mutual affection, to mutual affection love. For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they'll keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge. So I guess if we're feeling ineffective and unproductive, which we all feel at times, don't we? Maybe we should go back and think, well, am I living in self-control? Do I need to persevere through this thing a little bit more, etc." It can't be overstated, though. We work on our character. We work on ourselves, not to earn salvation, but as a response to it. Ephesians 2, for it's by grace you've been saved. It's not a work of your own, as if anybody could brag about it. It's a work of God because you've been prepared for what? Good work. See how they go together? And thirdly, work for eternity. On Jesus' final night with his disciples, he told them, look, you didn't choose me. I chose you and I appointed you so that you would go and bear fruit Fruit that will last forever. How long are those bananas going to last on your counter? A couple days. Then you put them in your freezer thinking you'll make banana bread and you never do. <laughs> they don't, it doesn't last. Jesus says, my fruit will last forever. 50, 60, 70 years from now, most of us will not be here. 100, 120 years from now, we'll all be out. Every one of us will all be gone. That can either freak you out or fill you with some kind of passion to live your life differently. Go and bear fruit. Go and spend your strength on the only thing that's going to last forever, the kingdom of God. Now, you can do that with any job. You don't have to be a pastor or a missionary. You can do that wherever you live, whatever your situation. It's this mindset. The Apostle Paul told the people of Colossae, he said, whatever you do, whatever you do, do it unto the Lord. Build houses unto the Lord. Raise your kids. Teach your kids unto the Lord. Be a nurse unto the Lord. Drive a bulldozer. Run your business Develop software unto the Lord. Run, do whatever you do unto the Lord. You can do CrossFit, bake cakes, play pickleball unto the Lord with the right mindset. Whatever you do, just do it as an offering to the Lord. Invite him into it. Now, all of that is great, but God will always have a unique expectation for us to also spend our strength specifically towards the broken, the poor, the
the vulnerable, the oppressed, the depressed, the marginalized, the vulnerable. As Isaiah the prophet famously said, spend yourselves, spend your strength on behalf of the hungry and satisfy the needs of the oppressed. Then your light will shine out from the darkness. The Lord will guide you continually, giving you water when you are dry and guess what? As a result of it, restoring your strength. As we spend our strength on the things he cares about, he'll give you more and more strength. I mean, maybe, I don't know if this is a fair metaphor, but it comes to mind. You know, like if I give my kid a hundred dollars and he blows it all at the arcade, <laughs> I'm probably not giving him any more. But if I give him a hundred dollars and he uses it for something really good or gives a lot of it away, here's another hundred. How much more then is God going to be like that? This work of love that we're called to is mostly expressed through how we relate to people because it's the only thing that lasts forever. Worship team, can you all come up here? So that's a bit of the direction we spend our strength for unity, for purity, for eternity. Maybe you can remember that. Yep, U-P-E, unity, purity, eternity. (laughs) Yep. Spend your strength for unity, for purity, for eternity. But what if you're weak? What if you're exhausted? Anybody there? Yes, you are. Just admit it. Almost everybody I talk to is expressing some measure of exhaustion. Maybe that's just what I'm hearing because I'm tired and you all are tired too. How do we gain strength, though? How do we gain strength? Well, we spend time with God. We wait on God. We hopefully go home from church and we chill out for the rest of the day. And we wait on the Lord. We rest. Rest is how we gain strength. And when we're alone with God, He will define the specific areas in your life that are sucking energy from you. My pickup went dead last year, and then I I realized there was this slow trickle effect that made it go dead over a long period of time. It wasn't like one night I left all the lights on. It was a slow drain. God will identify, if you will ask him, what the slow drains are in your life, the little bits of sin, the little bits of unforgiveness that you're holding on to that are just sucking the life out of you. Spend time with God. That's why we don't want to spend time alone with God because we know he's going to tell us stuff like that. But it's for our good. Spend time with God alone. Spend time in God's word. You'll find encouragement and inspiration you won't find anywhere else. Spend time with God's people. Even introverts get stronger being around other people. God's people. Together we make the pain and trouble of life bearable. And not only bearable, when we make our way through it and we look back, we realize James 1 was true. All that trouble and all that difficulty built us up, made us stronger, made us mature and complete. But people help, the God's people help us get there, help us get through those things. And lastly, be filled with the Spirit. Not like one night, like Friday night I was filled with the Spirit. Now I'm good for a long time. The word is be being filled. Be being filled every day. We need need to be continually filled. Why? Because the same Spirit that raised Jesus up from the dead. I mean, imagine that. Imagine the body of Jesus. Think about that. The body of Jesus, unable to do anything in itself. Dead. The Spirit comes in and breathes life to him. And then Jesus then is like, oh, here we are again. Like, it's the same thing. It happens for all of us. We talked about this last week or recently. He's the one who can wake up our soul. The Spirit helps us with this process 
of living more rightly every day. If by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. See how it goes together? The Spirit gives you the capacity to do it because you don't want to put to death all these other things you're doing that are God's not asked you to do. But the Spirit will give you the capacity to do it. And then you will live. The Spirit makes it possible. But we have to actively, intentionally obey God and change. He won't force you to. I have a little illustration that hopefully will work here. So this is, this is a glove. This is a work glove, okay? This glove, in and of itself, isn't going to do too much, right? In the same way that we cannot live the Christian life, the supernatural life, with our own strength. But is it, can we stop expecting non-Christians to act like Christians, by the way? We barely get it right. We cannot live the Christian life, we cannot live the supernatural life with our own strength. We were designed for supernatural living. We were designed to do incredible things with these lives of ours. But we can't do the incredible things of God without God living through us. So back to the illustration, this glove, right? This is a nice glove. I don't usually buy this, this good of quality gloves, but this was handed down to me. This glove is leather. It has a, uh, it has a good strap here to keep it on your, your hand. It's, it's getting a little rough, but this is, this is a good glove, right? So I can set this glove here next to my Bible, and I can command this glove. Glove, pick up that Bible. And... It, as you might have guessed, nothing happens, right? Well, maybe that glove needs a little encouragement, right? Come on, glove. You can do it. Look at you. You're strong. Look how close the Bible is. All you got to do is like, you know, go over here. You can do it. It's still nothing. Maybe that, maybe that glove needs a little training, right? Let's take that Bible and let's start giving it the truth. You know, uh, better yet, let's actually put it in the Bible. Now it's actually inside the Bible. How much more in the Word can you get? It's like literally in the Word. Come on, glove. Pick the Bible up. Mm, still can't do it. Um, oh, I know what I'll do. I will give this glove some fellowship, right? I'll put, I'll put some other gloves around it. Put that. Well, that's a good glove. Oh, this is a female glove. We'll give that love a, a partner there. We'll give it a few more. Let's, let's give it some multicultural feel, you know, some rounded out a little bit. And, okay, now we've got all those gloves. Let's see. Ah, still nothing. The glove is going to be completely useless unless a living hand fills it fully right? How much more are these bodies, these minds, these souls that were designed by God dependent on having the living Spirit of God fill them so that then they can do the work they were created to do? Now, finally, this work glove can do some work. Can we stand and we're going to worship together? If we're lacking strength to follow God, there's a million different reasons for it. And there are many different ways to regain it. But the night before Jesus was murdered, he said, there's a lot more you all need to know. But the Spirit is going to come and tell you. The Spirit will come and tell you what you need to know. And so that's the prime, that's why, that's what I'm going for right now. That's what we're going to primarily ask. If you need strength of any kind, would you hold your hands out? And if you're a little shy about it, you can do like this. 
God, would you, in your goodness, by your spirit, fill these bodies of ours? Would you fill these minds of ours? Would you refresh and fill these spirits and souls of ours? Would you point out to each of us and us as a church where there's a slow drain on our battery, on our power, Would you, by your spirit, so fill us with your power? Would you so live through us that we could live the life you created us to live? Let's worship, and I'll close us after this. Can we have a ministry team come forward, some small group? leaders come forward. So as we were worshiping, it struck me that most of my gloves are pretty shredded. Like there's all these holes in them. And you know, we're tempted to throw them out. Probably should throw them out and get some better gloves. But what, what, what struck me is that this is like a picture of our lives. We're a little broken. We've got some holes, right? But what if that's this added space for the Spirit of God to be revealed? That is how he does it. God's not going to throw you out. He can work through that just fine. I want to invite you to come for prayer. I think a lot of times we assume we'll get prayer later, and then you just don't. You won't do it. You think you will, but you won't. No offense. That's just how it is. So even if you have to wait a little bit, just wait a little bit. Come sit on the front row and wait. I'm going to dismiss you, and then I invite you to come forward and get prayer or to sit up front and just wait on the Lord, if you would, for a second. God, you're so good, so kind, Thank you for your commitment to us. Even when we're not committed to you, even when we're not faithful to you, you're so committed to us. God, we want to live with the strength you designed us to live with. We want to be people who carry your Holy Spirit wherever we go. So God, I pray in the name of Jesus, you would pour out your Spirit on the people of this church more and more and more so we would reflect your goodness to the world around us. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. All right, come forward for prayer or be dismissed. We love you. God bless you.